What is up, what's up? Sean here with Accelerators Organization, ready for another mentor session. So let's get this thing started. Okay, the first question comes from Ricardo. And Ricardo says, how can I incentivize employees to stay longer with my company? The background is I own and operate a barber business. <clears throat> I feel like if I can find a way to give the employees stock share or bonuses, that would incentivize them to stick around more and grow with the business. If there are any strategies that have worked out there, I would like to hear about them. Thank you. Okay, Ricardo, I've got about 10 different mentors answering this for you. It's really important that we think about how to incentivize our team members based on how they want to be incentivized. We've talked about this, you and I, quite a few times, and we've also talked about this at the leadership event that you came to, and you've heard the mentors talk about this in team building. Remember that all employees and team members are not motivated and incentivized equally. But there are some things, of course, you would like to do to keep people to stay with your company longer and longer. And I don't know much about the barber industry as it relates to people staying with you and your firm for years and years and years. But the easiest way to find out what it would take to incentivize somebody to stay with your organization for a long period of time is to ask them. Here are some things that immediately come into my mind that I would want to talk to them about. What if I, for every year that you are with the company, I give you X amount of dollars towards your continuing education in the form of sending you to conferences, to um, different barber technique schools, um, buying more product, a set of scissors and shears and all those different things. Every year that you stay on board with with premium barbers, your incentives will increase. It could be a combination of a lot of things. Think about like a cafeteria plan, you know, a cafeteria you walk through and you just pick out the different things that you want and it's kind of just, there's a whole smorgasbord. Let, you could also look to let your barbers pick and choose what things are good to them. So say, listen, each year I'm going to give you X amount of dollars. And these dollars can be used towards these bucket items each year. And that dollar amount increases each year. I'm always careful, and I learned this from my own businesses and just in networking with other higher level coaches and entrepreneurs. Very, very careful about giving up stock or equity in my company. I don't think it's a big thing to think about profit share as a problem, but... In some way, shape, or form, you are already doing a profit share when your barbers are getting a, a, a piece of the, uh, the revenue in which they're providing the service. They're already on that form of, of a compensation plan. I don't know if there's going to be enough money in your business for you to say, I'll give you back. I'm going to split up 20% of the profits among all the team members. Something certainly to take a look at when, you're, when your organization gets to a certain level. I don't know if that's something at this stage of your, of your cycle that you're ready for that. I would look to have more and more meetings with my barbers, find out what's important to them, build relationships, understand their goals, what they're working towards. My guess is, is that at some point you're going to come across some barber, one of your barbers that's going to say, I'd like to own my own location someday. And you say, great. Why don't we start with premium barbers as one of the first places? If you can help me recruit and fill up all of these chairs <clears throat> and keep it consistent and we make you a manager and you manage, manage the team, I might go into business with you and be your your investor in yours and you can run this shop and maybe I'll go open up another one and start building another one or you go open up the next one and build the next one. So those are some things that I think could pay bigger dividends for you as opposed to thinking profit share and stock and things like that. But stock, I certainly would stay away from because anything that would legally put them in ownership in your business, I don't think is you're at the stage that that'd be, that would be something that'd be beneficial for you. Okay. All right, <clears throat> excuse me.
excuse me, my voice is gone. I have, I have COVID right now in case you didn't know. Okay, the next question comes from Greg, and Greg says, I am contemplating purchasing a leads list. What is the best way to find a company that can provide me with a list that is right for my business? The background is, James answered a question about sales pipeline, and he said it's time to buy a leads list. I've not tried that before, and I'm wondering what reputable companies are out there to do this. James also mentioned Tom Black can help with scripts and methodologies. Any guidance would be appreciated. Okay, Greg, I've got about uh, seven different mentors answering this. For your first thing, as far as lead lists, I don't, I don't know anything about buying lead lists. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. If you want to, if you want me to put you in touch with James directly, if he has access to reputable lead list companies, shoot me an email. Um, go through the portal and just shoot me a message and say, "Hey, Sean, you said to get with you if I wanted to get an introduction to James." I put on some other mentors here that might know about lead lists, but that's not my forte. Um, as far as your sales scripts and things like that, this is along the lines of sales coaching, which you and I have spoken about. If you'd like to get to a point where you hire a sales coach and you want to work with a sales coach to work with you, I would budget $1,500 a month for a minimum of three months. Okay. But just remember this, you know, you've been one that's been getting involved and I appreciate that. You've also been one that's slow to invest in one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I don't know if that's a mental trigger, if it's an emotional thing, or if it's a finance thing. I'm not sure what it is. But if you're going to look at the pros and cons of investing in a coach, okay, remember this. How much do you charge for what you do? If a sales coach could help you generate one or two additional sales per month, would that be worth $1,500 a month? Would you make more money? Um, you know, I work with I work with quite a few agencies and things like that, and they're you know they're charging fifteen hundred dollars a month retainers and and up. So for them to increase their sales skills and work and have someone holding them accountable and teaching them each week on different sales techniques and strategies to help them close more deals, it's a no brainer. It's a great return on investment. So that's something I, I would urge you to think about is it's $1,500 a month, budget at least three months. It's a sales, you wouldn't be able to just hire Tom or me or another sales coach to say, hey, help me with my scripts and then you're probably gonna be off to the races. It'd be like, it'd be like me if, you are web if you're a web designer, it'd be like, hey, can I have one, one phone call with me, you, and you teach me how to build a website and I can learn it all in one phone call? probably not going to happen. So building out sales scripts, building out objection handling scripts, building out your sales funnel, understanding how to use your, your CRM system, that just takes time. Salespeople, you know, I've been in sales for decades and I still learn strategies today watching different sales newsletters I belong to. I learned some things through social media, watching some of the people that are starting to teach about sales on social media. I pick up new little strategies that sharpen my ax every single day. It's like continuing education. So yes, I could put you in touch with Tom Black, but I would say that you would wanna start working with Tom Black or me or another coach when you're ready to budget at least three months and, and work with somebody really deep for three months. And I think that that $4,500 investment will pay massive dividends to your business moving forward. In fact, most times when someone says, yeah, I'll commit to the first three months, they end up going, gosh, that three months went by so fast, we need to go another six months or another year because so many nuggets start to get dropped. So just give that some thought, okay? And I can introduce you to Tom if you want to. I can talk with you about sales coaching, but I think you're on the right mode here of learning and I think if we can just mentally get you over that next little step to get someone to dive deeper in your business from a high level like Tom could do like I could do I really think we could help unlock that next level of evolution in your business okay hope that helps okay next question comes from Demarius and Demarius says when should I hire my CPA as a bookkeeper the background is I operate a phone flipping business and I am a full-time home inspector. As business grows in both fields, how do I know when it's time to flip the switch and get a full-time bookkeeper? I've got about nine mentors answering this one for you, Demarius. I think the first thing is, is from a bookkeeping perspective, when it just gets to be a little bit too time-consuming for you to 
spend the certain amount of hours per month that it takes for you to reconcile your your personal and your business financial statements, that's the time to get a bookkeeper. As you know, you know there's some people we can refer you here in the group. You're probably talking somewhere between four and five hundred dollars a month at most for where you're at in your business. So the thing that you would want to weigh is, is it worth it for me to spend that three to five hundred dollars? to either A, free up some time that I can make more money with that time, which is one thing, or two, where I'd have some time to spend with my wife and, and enjoy life because I know you're working a lot of hours. And so sometimes you are freeing up from your, your $20 an hour work, which is the bookkeeping, to go do $50, $100 an hour work, a home inspection, flipping phones, whatever it might be, so you're exchanging the time and you're leveraging. Or the second thing is, is maybe you just want some free time to yourself to enjoy life. And so that's what you want to weigh emotionally. At this juncture, knowing you and what you're doing, I certainly think there can't be that many transactions that are happening within your QuickBooks that as long as you have your QuickBooks set up correctly, I don't think you would need to hire a bookkeeper at this juncture because the transactions are going to be relatively easy for you to reconcile. I think if you get to a point where you're spending more than 10 hours a month on reconciling your, your QuickBooks, that's when you would want to get you know a bookkeeper. But until then, that ten dollar, that ten hours a, a month, as long as you can do that when you're not doing inspections, whenever you know at home on the weekends, at night, early in the morning, whatever it might be, I would like to see you saving that money or, or investing it back in your business as opposed to freeing up some of your time right now. Just because I know that you've got big goals. Okay, hope that helps, man. Okay, the next question comes from Carrington. And Carrington says, how do you get featured on podcasts consistently? I run a product photography agency focusing on creating unique, scalable content for brands. I have been a guest on two podcasts, one which was through a referral, the other I met at a networking event. I'm wondering if expanding my audience through podcasting is a viable idea, and if so, what are the best ways of going about finding podcast hosts and getting featured on them? All right, I've got four different mentors answering this for you that have great experience getting on podcasts. Um... The first thing is, what are the best ways of finding podcast hosts? Well, all you got to do is go onto any podcasting application and search podcasts, and there you go. I mean, finding, it's like finding investors. Look for somebody who has money, and there's a potential investor. They're everywhere. So same thing with podcast hosts. You'd have to figure out exactly what, what value you could bring to a podcast host within what certain industry or niche. And then just reach out and start contacting them. Um, most times, it, you know, I'll tell you this, right? I know that Brian Clayton, who I'm going to have answer this for you, he has been going on a ton of podcasts. And Don Williams, who I'm going to have answer this, he actually has a podcast. Peter's been on a lot of podcasts. I think Paul David has. I have. I hired a PR agency that reached out to all the, the podcast companies. And for me, it was a waste of money. I didn't pick up a lot of business. I got a couple here and there, not many. And I had to pay the PR agency a bunch. I don't know if Brian's paying somebody or if he's doing it himself, but Brian's on a podcast like every week, it seems. Um, but I, that is a question that's going to be great, greatly answered by, by the four mentors that I have going for you. But I can tell you from my personal experience, I did not get a strong return on investment from going on podcasts. There is someone in the group, Kristen Landers, who you, who you know is in the group, she said that she's gone on quite a few podcasts and gotten um, gotten clients. You might want to reach out to her and ask her as a peer-to-peer, -peer, just you and Kristen talking together as well. But the other four mentors, they might be able to tell you as well. Um, but I can tell you, getting on podcasts, you have to bring something of value. So if you can figure out what that is, figure out what niche you know your your content would be great for for a podcast audience, reach out and just pitch them. I don't know how to do it. That's not my expertise, but I'm sure those other four mentors might have some value to bring to the table to help you uh, figure out how to do that, okay? Okay, the next question comes from Robin, and Robin says, what are the ideas you would have to build relationships with other local businesses in my area? 
The background, I am an independent artist and I sell my art to art enthusiasts and, and building an online e-commerce store. In order to build my audience locally, I'm looking for any ideas you might have to best network and get involved in the local community. Thanks. Okay, I've got a bunch of different mentors answering this one for you, Robin. And I rephrased your question to better be what I thought you were trying to, to ask, so I hope that that's okay. Getting involved in different communities is what's going to help you. So get involved with the Chamber of Commerce. Get involved with Toastmasters. Get involved with, with um, any Facebook groups. Get involved in any art communities. Get involved in any pet communities. Um, I, I think that those are just natural ways to get out there and meet people and and follow the same networking principles from all the same networking questions that you've been asking for years. Just go get involved. The more you get involved and the more you meet more people, the more you're going to naturally network. It's just that simple. It's just asking the same questions that Tom Black has always advised you from a networking perspective and just getting out there. But as long as you know how to talk about what you do and you have an easy way for people to, to go do business with you, then that's going to make it easier for you to get more business. Okay? All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Next question comes from Josh. And Josh says, how do I know what questions to ask mentors when I don't know what questions to ask? The background. Instafy is a new e-commerce business in the FBA retail and online arbitrage space. We are new and I just don't know what questions to ask you mentors in order for me to grow my company. I want to learn and I want to get guidance, but I'm a little stuck knowing what to ask. We are pretty much pre-revenue and just starting with the company. If it helps, I also have a full-time job, so I'm doing this on off hours with hopes to possibly quit my job someday. Josh, I got uh, about 12 different mentors answering this question for you, and I rephrased your question big time because the way that you had written it was going to be very confusing to the mentors, and I believe that this is best representing what you were trying to ask. I think that this is the this is a great question to ask, and I'm interested to hear what the other mentors have to say, but the bottom line is, is Ask questions that will help you reach your goals. So what is it that you're having a problem with? If you're having a problem getting new sales, well, what, have you, what are you trying? What's not working? What business are you in? Ask, the, ask the, um, the mentors for ideas on how to find new products, source new products, negotiate pricing, um, how to do advertising, how to build an audience how to drive traffic, how to use email marketing. There's so many different facets to your business, and I can't imagine that you know it all because I, from the weekly report you just did last week, you guys only sold two products. So obviously you have a lot to learn. So that's what I would say is where is the business stuck? And if you're only selling two products in a week, you're stuck. There's lots of things that you could be asking. So I would explain your business as best you can, like I said. Explain how you find customers. Say, this is the ideal customer that we're trying to find. What's the best way for me to drive traffic? There's so many things that you could be asking. The question I would be asking if I were you based on knowing that you have a full-time job and you're doing this part-time, I would be like, Josh, what is your goal? Like, is your goal to quit your job? and be in business full time? And if so, what type of time frame are you giving yourself? What type of money would it take in your business for you to be able to quit your job? Do you have those goals set up? You know, how many products would you have to sell based on your margins? Like I would wanna see you start setting some very specific goals with actionable timelines that you're trying to reach. Each and every week when I read your Flex Fridays, I don't even know what it is you're trying to work towards. I actually feel like you're like a data cruncher because everything is, is very data oriented instead of goal oriented of, of I'm trying to quit my job by this date. I'm trying to get $10,000 in sales by this date. I'm, it's, I, I'd like to see you more revenue and goal oriented to meet those challenges as opposed to I'm just going through the daily grind of just figuring things out just for the sake of figuring it out. I'm, 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 I'm missing that there's a little bit of pressure on yourself to get to 
whatever this end goal is or this first end goal is, right? So those are the types of questions I would be asking is, how far do I need to get along in my business until I can quit my full-time job? How did you get over the emotion of quitting your full-time job and going into your business full-time? Am I not a real, do I not have an entrepreneur spirit if I'm not willing to quit my job and go after my dreams and follow my dreams? Like these are some big questions that I would be asking myself if I were you, which is what is your goal? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? Are you, you know, what is the goal that you're trying to work towards? And I think that by diving deep into those questions, you're going to start to get even more questions in your head that the mentors can help you with. So just start asking Instead of treating your Friday, Flex Fridays like here's my daily report card, I'd like to see some more enthusiasm and passion around what is it that you're trying to get done with this business? Like where are you trying to get to and how, what can we do to help you get there? You haven't asked once about how to source products, how to figure out what products are the right types of products that are moving. I don't know if you've networked with Todd who is in your space I mean, if it were me and I was in this business that you're talking about with Instafy, I would literally be calling me and saying, hey, Sean, I need to get a hold of Todd. How do I get Todd's phone number? Can you give me an introduction? Because Todd's in your space and he's a mentor and he's doing millions. He actually knows how to do what it is you're trying to do. That's who I'd want to learn from. So that, I hope that answers your question of when you don't know what to ask, tell us where you're stuck. Tell us where you're having a problem. And let us try to give you some ideas. If those ideas aren't the right ideas, tell us where we're getting it wrong and try to give some more clarity into where it is that you're stuck. Cool? But I appreciate your discipline of doing Flex Fridays. I appreciate the discipline of having a full-time job and doing this on the side. But as an entrepreneur myself, I'd like to see more passion around you wanting to actually live your life as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, taking the risk, quitting that job, going all in, following that passion. That is what really makes most entrepreneurs happy and excited about waking up each day. Okay? Hope that helps, brother. And we missed you at the Summer Social. All right. Next question comes from Michael. And Michael says, after you buy into a business, how do you quantify that you have got your investment back? The background is I bought into Ticket Scene a year ago have been working at it and have just quit my day job in April. So now the business is paying my wages, but it is only paying what I would have made in my day job. At present, I don't believe this is getting my investment back. Okay, well listen, welcome to the club of being an entrepreneur. Do you know how many, do you know what the average income of a small business owner is, is in America? Do you realize that the average income of a small business owner in America is like around $70,000 a year? And it might even be less than that. Have you ever seen that saying that I'd rather work 80 hours a week in my own business than 40 hours a week for somebody else and make the same amount of money? Welcome to being an entrepreneur. So I think that, that there's something to be grateful here in that you now belong to a business that has enabled you to quit your day job and you're making the same amount of money working for yourself that's a huge, huge breakthrough. Now, the question I would be asking is to your, I don't know how much percentage you own. I don't know if you did a debt investment, an equity investment, what the terms are of your operating agreement of how you get repaid back, or if it's just an equity investment and now you're going to make your money as salary and dividends. Like, I don't know what your structure is, but that's where I would dig in. If I was your personal mentor or coach, I'd be like, well, let's talk about the structure. How do you make more money? If now that you're in the business full time in April and now you're full time and you're already make, covering the same exact wage that you had at your full time job, now what I would do is put a clear path together with your business partner or partners and say, hey, how do we all make more money together? You know, do I have a clearly structured compensation plan that includes incentive compensation as far as bonuses, profit sharing, commissions, or otherwise? Those are the things that are going to help you get to a point where you're going to receive back more on your investment. Most business owners that invest into a business, they don't make a return on their money until years down the road. And the real return is going to be if and when you actually get to exit or sell the business. And, and then let's say you own 30% of the company and you sell it for $10 million and you get $3 bucks. That's where the real return is. 
So the return that you've already received is that it's enabled you to quit your job and now you're in this business full time. That's fantastic. I would talk to my business partners and say, hey, it's on my mind that I want to actually make more than I was making at my day job. Can, I, can we put together a clearly concise compensation plan that makes me double what I was making at my day job? You know, those are those are conversations to have with your uh, your investor or with your partners. But I think it's great, man. I think that's fantastic. OK, I'm going to answer one more question right now because I'm losing my voice. And then I'm going to answer the rest of the questions that are in the queue, which is another seven or so questions. I'll answer these tomorrow on a mentor session as well. The next question and the last one comes from Kelly. And Kelly says, what steps would I need to take if I wanted to try and find it? and hire a commission-based salesperson since I don't have a budget to pay a salary, but I know there is business out there. The background is I own an excavation company specializing in site prep, trenching, and road construction. I am a one-man show. I need to drive sales. I need more work. Having, having someone else sell and pay them commission is a very new concept for me, but something that I think will benefit my growth. What steps do I need to take to make this happen if possible? Okay, I've got about seven, eight different mentors answering this for you. So I started my last company just like you, Kelly, I've told the story many times. Here's what I did. After I proved what it would take from a sales cycle to go get new business, if I dedicated my time to go out and make sales, and I, 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 always, I always put this to about a 90-day thing. If you dedicated 60 to 90 days to going out there and getting new business, how many new clients could you bring on? What would be the total revenue? And what would be the gross profit from that revenue? Not your net profit, your gross profit. And if you don't know that, you know, ask a question around that and I can get you an answer around that. Once you can determine what those numbers are, it's going to tell you how much you could have paid a salesperson and could pay a salesperson if you hired them to go out and do it. So if you could say right now, I would know how to train someone who knows how to sell. I would know how to train them on going out there and, f and finding leads, pitching my company's products and service, pitching my, pro my company's services, negotiating the price, presenting a contract, overcoming the objections, and then closing a deal. And there would be they, I could pay them 15 to 20% commission on every dollar they bring in. If you can say that you would exactly know how to do that right now and you know what that revenue would be if you hired somebody on the first of the month, you know how soon they're going to close their first deal and how much commission they're going to make each month, then you're ready to hire a salesperson right now. If you don't have all those answers and you don't have all the, that training ready to go right now, then you're not ready to hire a salesperson. Because if somebody's going to put their family's finances in your hands, I need to know that you know how to train me on how, how to go find the business, close the business, and that you know how much money that's going to mean to the company and what that's going to mean to me. And I'm not going to work. I can't work for 90, 100 days to wait to get paid. So if you could clearly show me that if I work my butt off, and for, for two weeks, that in two weeks I'm going to have a paycheck for three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 from the business that I close, show me the way, master. But that's what bringing on a salesperson requires. You have a clear path to that person making money themselves. You are going to make money, of course, but you've got to be able to show them that they're going to make money. This is a whole process. Where do you find the leads? How do you reach out to them? What do you say? How do you present Kelco Construction? What are all the different services? Do they have to have industry of knowledge and know how to even present the services and how it works to the customers? Like what kind of sales do they need? Industry experience, all that type of stuff. How long does it take to close a deal? What are your margins so that you know how much you can pay that person in commission? And you're off to the races, okay? So that's what it would take to hire a commissioned or any type of salesperson. And here, remember this too, Kelly. Every salesperson is on commission. Even if you paid them a base salary, a draw, whatever it might be, every salesperson is on salary. If they don't close deals, you're either going to fire them or they're going to quit. One of the one of the two. So 
every salesperson is on commission. And I'm a salesperson. Even when I had salaries back in the day, I was, I, if I didn't close, I didn't have a job. Okay. So that's something to think about. But one of the ways that I would think that you could go out there and get business right now, since you're a one person show, and I don't know if we've talked about this, we may have, but you, you're, you're kind of more in the subcontractor field right now, being a one person operation. I would be going out there and talking to every general contractor and every other bigger company and saying, I've got all this equipment, I'm licensed to do all these things. I know that there is so much freaking business because everybody in the construction industry that I talk to says that nobody wants to work. So if you just go out there and meet more and more contractors, then they're probably, and you let you make sure that they know that you are available to work. I just can't imagine that they're not going to be picking up the phone to call you. And I, I mean, I would almost have 10, 20, 30 of those people on my speed dial. And every single Friday or every single Monday, I would be hitting every single one of them up. Hey, John, Kelly here with Kelco Construction. Just want to let you know, I've got these dates available in my schedule. As a reminder, these are the services that I provide. Let me know if there's any projects I can help you with. I will work sun up to sun down, blah, blah, blah. I've got my own equipment. I've got my own licensing. I've got my own insurance. I would, and then, you know, just give me a call. And I would make those quick 20, 30 phone calls every Friday or every Monday just to let everybody know that I am available. That's what I would do. And then if it gets to a point that you're so busy that you can't make those phone calls because there's so much business coming in, then you have that, the, that data to be able to show a salesperson, I just need you one day a week, two days a week, to call all these contractors and let them know that we are available for hire, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. It's a touch game. Get in front of as many people, let them know you're available, and see who responds, okay? All right, that's today's mentor session. I'll be back on tomorrow for another mentor session. If uh, you have any questions, anybody, go into the portal, ask some questions, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. Peace out.